This is Witchbase News for Friday the 30th of August 2024 I'm Commander Burr. In Elite Dangerous News this week there's a rare narcotic festival about to start in the bubble. As the dust settles on the engineering revamp we have an excellent guide to surface conflict zones and as the first tendrils of power play 2 are felt in the Elite Dangerous Galaxy Frontier invites questions on the incoming update. If you enjoy our videos consider subscribing to the channel and remember to ding the little bell to make sure you see all our content and community posts and if you'd like to help support the channel links to our Patreon and everything else are in the description below. Regular viewers to this broadcast may possibly remember the Morpheus Mining Company's Thanksgiving Festival of 3309. For the uninitiated the narcotic commodity known as Wolf Fesh is only available in the Wolf 1301 system and even then it's only available if an anarchy faction is controlling the system and for most of the year it isn't. However, during the aforementioned Thanksgiving festival, the players of the Morpheus Mining Company, aided and abetted by a string of allies, manipulate the BGS in the system to specifically put Fesh back on the menu. I'm telling you this now because Fesh is about to be back on the menu again. Preparation for Fesh Festival 3310 is currently well underway by the MMCO with the assistance of the Soteria Accord, the Open Pilots Initiative and Cosmic Independence Agency to name but a few and it's anticipated that the drug will be available again to buy exclusively from Saunders Dive in Wolf 1301 from the Servitic on Thursday September the 5th. If you're having trouble saying fesh festival by the way just pretend to be Sean Connery. Sorry. How long, it, how long it lasts is down to the mutterings of the BGS so if you're in the market I wouldn't hang about once the flare goes up. Laconic Texan and serial hat aficionado Commander Exorcist normally recognised for the excellent out there series of deep space exploration journals as well as his exobiology and exploration guides this week broke with his elite dangerous mould and produced an excellent guide detailing the other lesser known side of his elite dangerous gaming personality that of the surface conflict zone merc for hire. The fascinating guide rather than focusing on the specifics of how to fight in a conflict zone instead centres more on the overall conflict zone experience, what rewards to expect from it and, really importantly, just what the conflict zone experience is like now 3 years after their initial shaky arrival in the game as part of the Odyssey on foot expansion. Exorcist quite rightly points out at the start of the video that the surface conflict zone experience was more than a little tainted by its association with everything else Odyssey when it first launched but since that time the expansion as a whole as well as the CZs have been significantly improved and both are now in a much much better place. And with the recent revamp of engineering which lands just as heavily in the on foot experience there has never been a better time to upgrade your gear and sample the other areas that Odyssey has to offer. As well as covering what you'll get from a conflict zone the guide also covers how to find them using in game tools on the map as well as Inara and then how to physically get to a conflict zone covering off services like the dropships of Frontline Solutions which by the way is one of Odyssey's cooler signature experiences if you've not yet done it. The whole guide is in the form of a voiceover to some of Exorcist's conflict zone gameplay which also affords you the opportunity to see just exactly what the experience is like quite literally at ground level while Exorcist's soothing tones ease into your cerebellum. As you'll see X has some not insignificant on foot skills and so if nothing else the video makes for some entertaining viewing. 
You'll find Commander Exorcist's guide to surface conflict zones linked below this video. When Frontier gave the community their first proper look at the Zorgon Peterson Mandalay Explorer class vessel earlier this week they also announced that the incoming Powerplay 2.0 system was going to experience a small delay before its launch. It had previously been the plan that Powerplay would be getting its long overdue refresh in September however in order to ensure that the update is in the best state that it can be Frontier have wisely chosen to push the product back by a few weeks and will now instead be launching it alongside the aforementioned new ship the Mandalay. Whilst Powerplay and its incoming socio-political upheaval are still now an extra few weeks away I can't help but feel that the shadow of the incoming update is already beginning to show on the face of the galaxy. In some recent Galnet news articles it does appear that some of the power players and indeed some potential new power players are starting to draw their battle lines and reaffirm their respective positions. At the start of August the shuttlecraft of the Imperial Emperor herself Arissa Lavigny Duval was attacked when returning to the capital ship INV Akenar's Valor in the Kubio system. The attack was thwarted by the ships of her Imperial Guard but the perpetrators or at least the bits of them left orbiting Kubio 3 have yet to be identified at least publicly. Were this an isolated incident it could just be written off as yet another random terrorist attack or the attentions of a generally disgruntled pressure group with a cause. You don't after all rise to a position like Emperor without ruffling a few feathers or indeed stamping on a few strawberries. It isn't however as you will have likely guessed by now dear viewer the only incident. A fortnight after the Kubio incident a shuttle on the planet Nanomam 1 that was waiting to pick up Federation shadow president in waiting Jerome Archer exploded as he approached the vehicle. Whilst the soon to be leader of the opposition in the Federation was unharmed the blast claimed the lives of three government workers. The red hot shards of previously shuttle shaped metal were still cooling down when the attack was claimed by Archon Delane. For the uninitiated Archon Delane is one of the power players under the current power play system and is according to his own description the pirate king of the Kumo crew. The Kumo crew being one of the larger and more influential criminal syndicates in the bubble around Sol. When claiming the attack against Jerome Archer Delane also appeared to hint that he may have also been behind the attack earlier in the month on the Emperor but interestingly he didn't actually claim that particular attack directly and Delane is specifically known for being the more direct you know where you stand kind of psychopath. Whatever the case there's enough of a lack of evidence to leave the identity of the perpetrators of the Imperial incident still in significant doubt. These two incidents alone did leave me feeling that Delane and at least one other are possibly having their positions and beliefs reaffirmed by the dungeon masters at FDEV before Powerplay the next generation lands. As if that wasn't enough however and why would it be Galnet burst into life again on Thursday with a significantly less violent but altogether more definite lean into the theory that the threads of Powerplay 2 Armed and Fabulous are already very much amongst us. The article concerns the departure from office of longtime president serial party pooper and part time T1000 looky likey Zachary Hudson and his replacement at the top of the federal republican party by the aforementioned Jerome Archer. The article very specifically mentions in fact that upon Archer's ascension he will inherit Zach's power base. This would seem to be confirmation at the very least that to put it mildly the portraits in Powerplay are changing. This idea is further pointed out when the article goes on to detail the rise in influence of one councillor Nakato Kane of the Alliance who whilst absolutely standing with the Alliance very much stands in opposition to the incumbent Alliance Premier Edmund Mahon. 
As things stand with the current iteration of Powerplay if you plan on supporting the Alliance you have but one choice with whom to place your allegiances the aforementioned Premier Mahon. Not only does this limit Alliance players choices but also has the effect of making the Alliance power fairly unopposable. Support for the other major superpowers is diluted amongst any number of different power players each with their own agendas. If however you vote Alliance you vote Mahon and that's it. The direct implication from this weeks Galnet is that with the arrival of Powerplay 2 Electric Boogaloo Alliance support is likely to be similarly diluted by the addition of at least one more extra power player into the fold. Whilst we're talking all things power play, Frontier did mention during the livestream on Wednesday that a thread would be arriving on the forums that is specifically designed to soak up all the many questions that are already being asked about the incoming system. That thread actually arrived during the making of this video and you'll find it linked below. It's important to note that the thread is designed very much to collect questions from the community into one place and not answer them or encourage their debate. Those answers from Frontier themselves are expected to form part of a future livestream segment that will deal with Powerplay 2.0 specifically. Powerplay is almost certainly going to deliver some major upheaval to the bubble at the very least and it'll be fascinating to see going forward how the community take to it and whether Frontier have this time got the balance right with the much maligned, often ignored but nonetheless interesting system. Will you be buying a carrier load of wolf fesh in the festival next week? Are you planning on trying out a surface conflict zone for the first time and will you be trying out power play when it lands in October? Let us know in the comments below. That's it for now. Thanks very much for watching. We'll be back later this week with more videos. Until then 07 CMDRs follow the greens on the way out and do keep clear of the toast rack. We very much look forward to seeing you next time. There is little room in Tupolev's heart for anyone but Tupolev. Yeah?